Welcome to the Down Dog Athletics Podcast, a competitor's guide to mental health and mastery. My name is Paul Kleen. I've known sports and training my entire life, but it wasn't until I worked on my mind that I finally started achieving what I believed I was capable of. When I combined mindful and spiritual practices to my already competitive demeanor, I gained a new level of clarity in life and traded my career at Amazon to start Down Dog Athletics. In this podcast, I interview top athletes and coaches to uncover the mindsets of top performers. You'll hear from doctors, authors, and experts in the health space as they break down how to take your mental health, physical health, and performance to the next level. And last but not least, you'll hear from me and my experiences and how I'm cultivating growth for myself and my clients, both mentally and physically. Let's go. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Mindful Muscle Podcast, Competitor's Guide to Mental Health and Mastery. My name is Paul Klingen. I am your host, and it's good to be back. Took a little bit of time off, had a bunch of other projects, a bunch of other pans uh, on the oven, and wanted to give those uh, the attention and focus and commitment that they really deserved. And the big one, obviously, is the eight-week challenge. If you've followed me at all over the last month, uh, I've talked a lot about this group of 40-plus people as we're going through an entire training program, an entire nutrition program, uh, weekly calls, a bunch of recipe books, basically taking everything that I do uh, as a fitness coach, nutrition coach, uh, and also educating people a ton on mindfulness uh, and a ton of really just on the, the, the weekly calls of almost like a curriculum as you would in like a school class. Uh, but a lot of people seeing really cool results and that's just been more of my focus has been. And so I miss you guys on the podcast. Going to get back to this as we get the balls rolling, getting some people on the Down Dog Athletics team, which is super exciting. Uh, and I just took a trip to Palm Springs. And so now I've got a very base level 10 and I'm feeling focused and was lucky enough to hop on a podcast uh, with Joe Hawley. And when I got the uh, email where he reached out, I was like, wow, this guy is the ideal podcast guest to talk about mental health as a former athlete. He played eight years in the NFL for the Falcons and the Bucks. I uh, retired in 2017 and basically sold all his possessions and traveled the United States in a van and he did the man van dog blog with his dog freedom and his story and his transformation and his journey to find you know a new vision a new identity post professional sports i found just to be inspiring and entertaining and right up my alley and this podcast alley uh, we talk about men's emotional health and the work that he does with former professional athletes through the heart collective talk about the work that he does on his podcast uh, and we, we dive deep. We dive into a lot of stuff that I've talked about on the podcast about yoga, meditation, and really slowing down so that you can really understand uh, what it is that your soul, your your purpose, uh, and your vision really is. And it can evolve. And he talks about how he's evolved as a professional athlete now to being an entrepreneur uh, and getting into a lot of really cool spiritual things. And I think if you've liked a lot of the stuff on the podcast, you'll really love this podcast. So without further ado, here we go. Joe Holly. Joe, what's up, man? Thanks for coming on the Mindful Muscle Podcast. Yeah, brother. Thanks for having me. Excited about it. What's uh what's the last couple last couple weeks been like in in your world? I know a lot of the um fit for service people have been getting together, but mm. you're in, you know, Texas right now. Uh what what's kind of twenty twenty one been like for you? Off yeah, man, it's been a, it's been a lot. The last couple of weeks have been crazy because the weather that's come through, it's a, a cold front kind of froze all of Texas. And yeah, luckily, you know, we were at without power and our water pipes froze, but luckily my parents live about 30 minutes south in San Marcos. They're a little bit better off. So we went and spent the week with them, but it was just a, a reminder of the, the little things I take for granted, like a, like a warm shower and access to internet. You know, maybe maybe question what the world would be like without internet because right. I was just not having Wi-Fi and especially, you know, being an entrepreneur and building my business from home um, needed to be connected. And luckily, my parents' power was working. Um, but yeah, man, 2021 has been off to a great start. A lot of uh, creation energy. Um, you know, during COVID, I had a lot of space, like most people, to really focus on what I wanted to bring into the world and, um, you know, laid the foundation for a lot of the projects I'm working on now. Uh, which are starting to to pick up momentum, which is really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. You had a lot of time to kind of think through what you wanted your purpose to be, right, with Man Van Dog Blog, and then you had COVID. So you've kind of had several years to to queue up and really align and find some clarity on this. Let's talk first about the Heart Collective and what that is and how you're creating a lot of really cool shifts 
uh, for men and athletes and such. Yeah, yeah. The Heart Collective is is what I'm working on now. I launched it a few months ago. It is a community built exclusively for former male professional athletes. Um, I played in the NFL for eight years. And when I walked away in 2017, I was faced with a, a lot of the unique challenges that were really something I didn't wasn't prepared for. I don't think there are things that you can prepare for. And, you know, like you said, with the man van dog blog thing, for my own personal journey of transitioning out of professional sports, I decided to to give everything I owned away to charity. I wanted to know who I was without this thing that I'd spent my entire life pursuing greatness at, all the stuff that I acquired, all the stories that I thought of who I was. So I decided to figure out who that was, who I was. Um, and so I decided to go on a road trip across the country and I traveled for the better part of two years, chronicled the journey on, on my blog, Man Van Dog blog, um, shared the journey on social media. It was a lot of fun, but it came to a point where I realized this is not what I want to do forever. Um, and I wanted to get into business and entrepreneurship and have a bigger impact in the world. And it wasn't until I started asking myself, you know, how, how can I be of service in a bigger way when I started, you know, I felt this calling to show up and help, um, my brotherhood, you know, former athletes, not only in the transition process, but helping them find themselves in a deeper, more meaningful way. And that led me to create the heart collective, um, you know, it's, it's been a wild journey. I've been on my own deep healing journey over the last couple of years, um, uncovering the deeper stories of, of who I am. And I think the foundation from playing at the professional level, what it took to reach that, that pinnacle, um, really gave me a strong foundation into the work I'm doing now. Um, the emotional intelligence, the deep healing work from within. And I know that the community that I'm building, um, uh, the reason I'm really excited about working with former pro athletes is because, they also have the foundation. They know what it takes to, to reach the top, the mental toughness, the discipline. All of these things when turned inward and applied to the self can really lead to a lot of exponential growth. And, you know, as athletes, we are role models and people look up to us in our society and our culture. And so in order for me to have a bigger impact, this is kind of the community that I'm building. It's kind of a top-down approach to really help facilitate healing for these guys in order for them to, uh, you know, send the ripples out of positive change into the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the most admirable things that you can do as a former athlete because everyone, like there's a lot of people go talk about sports or they'll go kind of live off that identity. I think one question I'd have for you is what do you think your identity and like the true Joe is more reflective of what you're doing now and football is just something that you were good at, you were supposed to do, you followed those stories or do you look at it more as like, that's who I was, I've evolved, and now I am who I am? Yeah, I think it's a constant process of evolving. Um, you know, in those moments, that's who I was. It taught me a lot about who I am, what I'm capable of. You know, I think the journey through life is just a series of lessons, challenges, tribulations. Um, you know, there's also a lot of good things that, that happen. But the journey really teaches us uh, who we are on a, on a, on a bigger scale. And so I think the essence of who I am has never shifted. I've always had this innate trust in the universe um, and this ability to continue to push myself outside my comfort zone. Um, but, you know, I was surprised how much football was a part of my identity. You know, I was very aware while I was playing because there's always people telling us, like, be prepared, have a second, you know, a, a game plan for when you're done, have a, a backup plan, all this stuff. And it's just something that I told myself, you know, football – is not who I am. It's something I do. And so I was really unprepared when I ended up walking. Luckily I walked away on my own terms, which I think is very rare for, for professional athletes. A lot of times their careers cut short for whatever reason, whether it's injury or they just kind of fizzle out. You know, I was walking away on my own terms, really excited about what was next, challenging myself in new ways, getting into new adventures. And I was so surprised and, you know, hit like a ton of bricks when I realized, wow, this is, was such a huge part of who I was. And so I went on this journey of really having to deeply process and grieve the loss of that aspect of who I was, right? There's a, a form of ego death. And that's all we are is, you know, the ego is just a story, a construct of who we think we are and how we interrelate with the world. It's the lens in which we view reality. And so in those moments, that's who I was and it, and it served me. But then there was this something deep within my soul that was calling me to do something else. And, you know, that that last year I was playing, I went through a lot of transitions. I, I ended up breaking off an engagement to a woman I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with. Obviously, I was saying goodbye to football. And this old whole way of being, 
I had to let go of. And that was really challenging. It was not an easy process at all, but there was something deep within me that was calling me into this, this unknown realm. And I think um, a lot of people can relate to that, you know, whether they go through a big breakup, uh, lose their job, have to transition cities. We all go through major transitions in our lives. And in those moments, it's a real opportunity to look at ourselves and start to recreate and retell ourselves a new story of who we want to become. And I think you have to be able to let go and properly grieve the old way of being, which is really challenging for a lot of people because, you know, it's human nature to want to create comfort and create a known environment and know what to expect and have a routine. And when that's kind of shattered, it, it forces us to really look inward and ask the deeper questions. And I definitely went through that and, you know, I've come out and grown and expanded in a lot of profound ways from that journey. And it's taught me a lot about who I am and the work that I'm here to do in the world. Yeah, dude, that's super powerful. The the attachment that we have to the past and how things were, what you know, a relationship used to be or what our job or our physique used to be, the delta between that and where you are now, I find is where a lot of suffering happens. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what uh, the biggest fear like story that you had to overcome when you were walking away from the NFL, you were walking away from financial security or fame or whatever that you know people would think would give you stability and security? What was like the biggest thing that you had to get over when you were kind of laying down that older version of yourself? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge that was kind of a, a surprise um, was, you know, it wasn't just me that had my identity wrapped up in, in football. It was, it was my partner at the time, um, my fiance. She really struggled and that was part of the the reason we ended up transitioning out of our relationship was, you know, the one person that was there supposed to be there to support me, you know, she wasn't happy about me walking away, you know, and then I told my parents, you know, that their whole image of having this, you know, football player son that played in the NFL and how to navigate, you know, their identity of who I was, you know, I remember telling my dad, he was like, you're going to, you're going to like, why would you walk away? Like, that's the dumbest thing ever. Like, you're going to say no to millions of dollars and, and continuing to live this dream that everybody wishes they could do. But it was just they don't see the challenges and the difficulty and how hard it is, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally to have to, to compete at that high a level. And so that created a lot, of, a lot of distance, a lot of isolation, a lot of loneliness. And that's part of the reason I decided to hit the road is because I didn't feel really grounded anywhere. I didn't have anywhere to call home. I knew I didn't want to stay in Tampa where I played with the Bucks uh, in 2017. It was my last year there and <clears throat> didn't have anybody really grounding me there. My family, I grew up in Southern California, but they moved to Texas. Um, and I have friends kind of scattered all, all over the country. Uh, a lot of good friends in Atlanta because I played there for a few years, but I just didn't really know where to end up, what I was going to do after. And it was just like this whole feeling of ungrounded and feel really supported by anybody with the decision. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to go do my thing. I'm going to go travel and figure out who I am without the need of all these, you know, all this validation that I've been receiving my entire life from everybody I love, everybody I know, the media, the fans. And, um, yeah, it was just a, it was a beautiful journey. It was it, like feeling isolated from those relationships and being able to go on my own deep healing journey from within. I realized that the way I was showing up in those relationships was just as much a result of the disconnection as the way they were you know, all relationships and all people are just mirrors for our own inner world. And understanding that I've done, I've been on this deep healing journey. And it's been really beautiful because the universe has kind of brought me back to Texas where I've actually landed and feel really grounded. I'm now married. I have a baby on the way. And my parents only live 30 minutes south of here. And I remember when I first came here, we, we kind of were estranged. There's a long backstory of me and my parents and the disconnection that we felt. But you know, I deeply desired a, a deeper connection with my, my, my parents. And, you know, I was a mama's boy growing up. My, my dad was never really super present in my life. He was not a bad dude, but he just didn't really know how to show up as the man I needed. So I created all these stories within myself. And so over the last year, it's been a really beautiful opportunity to heal those relationships and being around them and feeling the triggers come up from within me and being able to understand those are my triggers. It's nothing they're doing to me. It's what's coming up from within myself. It, and increasing my awareness of that and being able to move through that has really allowed me to reconnect with them. And we've gotten to a place now where I really can't wait to hang out with them. And this, there's this deep love that I've always deeply desired from them that has now come to the surface because I am showing up for who I am on a deeper level, not as an athlete, but as Joe, the person. And, you know, the confidence for me to show up in that way um, is allowing them to show up for who they are. And it's just a really beautiful thing. Absolutely. Dude, the, 
the work it sounds like you've done from like a, an emotional health standpoint, sounds like it's been huge. Mm-hmm. Would you attribute that to therapy? Obviously you had a lot of self-healing journey on your own, working with coaches. Like what would you say have been the things that have really helped guide you along that journey? Cause I know for men, it's something that's really hard to do to get in touch with that side and, and reconnect and you know, not be this like stoic facade of like, I don't feel anything. Yeah. It's the, it's the, sh- shadow immature masculine that shows up so deeply in our culture and you know the thing that's helped me tremendously has been community and that's why I'm so inspired and excited about building a community to help support other men um, because community has really helped me tremendously I know you talked about fit for service that has had a profound impact on my life being able to be around like-minded individuals in a safe container to share myself openly and vulnerably without fear of being judged, the things that I hold on to and have held on to and uncovering the stories that were even in my unconscious that I felt shame around, being able to express that in, in the presence of others who are not judging you, who but are there seeing you, that is deeply, deeply healing. And that's what I'm trying to provide in this container, in this community that I'm building. It's not, there's nothing that I have that's going to save people or heal people. The journey is your own, but it's about creating an awareness of the things and the stories from within that are coming up that are keeping us back from, you know, loving ourselves fully and just being able to have an, build a container where we can express ourselves openly and talk about the deep shames that we have and, and be able to do the work together has been, you know, profoundly impactful on, on my life. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the work then and the healing that you'd help the men with, right? It's not just physical healing. It's not just emotional healing. Um, I'm sure there's nutritional. I was reading some about you having to have two Chipotle burritos a day, <laughs> right? I've been there as well. It's tough. Uh, but it, like, there's so much that you can look at to heal. And it's not just like, you know, bru- like broken bones and ACLs, right? There's so much more to that. Uh, is, is there also though a degree to like, Hey, you know, you were a lineman that had to eat a ton. You were super beat up, ton of inflammation, and you do a lot of yoga like what other modalities and and how are you looking holistically at health with these guys yeah um, I think it all starts physically obviously in our bodies if we can't if we don't know what feeling good feels like then we're not going to be able to access higher levels of awareness right and understand our emotional body our mental body and our spiritual body but you know I think a big piece of it that is missing in our culture is this spiritual aspect we you know, when I, when I realized that, and, and this is a, a, an amazing quote that really changed everything for me, we are not humans who have spiritual experiences, but we are spirits who are having a human experience. And from that lens, everything is spiritual. This whole existence is a spiritual experience. And I think the disconnection from that is what leads to the disconnection of everything. And in order to access these higher levels of self-awareness, we have to feel good in our physical bodies. That's where it all starts. And that's where my journey started, right? When I, when I was done playing football, I lost a bunch of weight. I started doing yoga. And it all started with I was in such pain that I wanted to take care of it. So I started a yoga practice, a daily yoga practice, because it made me feel so good in my physical body. And then, you know, obviously, I had a meditation practice as well and all these things that I started implementing. But it wasn't until I was on the, on the mat when I started sitting in the resistance of these poses when I was able to have an awareness of my thoughts and where they come from and creating that space between the thinking mind and the observer of the thinking mind, this metacognition, right? The thinking about thinking. I think that is the awakening that really everybody needs to go through because we're so attached to our thoughts and the stories. We think that's who we are. And in reality, we're so much more than that. And we have to be able to find time and, and stillness to, to create that space in order to uncover okay, I'm the person observing these stories. And when you can get to that space, you can start looking at the stories that are a lot of times unconscious, which cloud the lens in which we view reality, whether that's a trigger that comes up because something happened or an emotion, being able to understand those on a deeper level allows us to be a lot more present with the experience of life as it's unfolding in front of us. Absolutely. That it's similar to an experience that I had several times in yoga as well, where very rarely in today's society, especially I'm in Seattle, are you encouraged to slow down even just Mm. taking two minutes just to breathe people are like i don't have two minutes it's like well then you probably need to take 20 minutes to (laughs) to find to find those two minutes Uh, but it 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 is in that stillness in yoga in meditation where 
you really have to, whether you got the mirror in front of you visually reflecting and you like literally reflect. I know that was a big one for me and like being like, who am I in this mirror? And getting to that point to where you can slow down to where those little voices, whether it's your, your soul's calling, whether it's stories that you're able to actually sit there and observe and be like, wait a second, this isn't true. But mm. until we slow down, we don't get that opportunity. Mm. Absolutely, man. And there's so many different tools and practices that, that I've learned to, you know, help navigate those stories. And, you know, I think one of the most powerful ones that I had a lot of resistance to um, early on was this was journaling and writing things down. And it, it's fascinating because when I played football, um, I'd take, you know, really a lot of notes, even though I knew a game plan and I know the playbook like the back of my hand, if we're installing, I would just write it down and how rarely I would actually go back and refer to my notes because just the act of writing it down would allow it to close the loop in my mind and it would, it would kind of imprint it and allow me to remember it. So I was very familiar with writing down stuff like that, but I had so much resistance to like journaling because, you know, I, I always told myself the story that I'm not a good writer. and even when I sit down to journal, I would be trying to write and like as if somebody was going to read what I was writing. So I tried to sound all intellectual and smart and I would edit it and all this stuff. And until I was introduced to the stream of consciousness journaling, where you just write what comes to your mind, that really had a profound impact on me understanding who I was because something magical happens. And I use a computer so I can type kind of really fast as it comes through. And just literally the thoughts that are streaming through my mind and I, you start writing them down and something magical happens where I, I can literally start having a conversation with myself, with, with the stories of who I am. Like, where does this story come from? And then just words start typing. And it's just a really beautiful reflection for us and a tool for us to really understand and dive into the stories that we are living out in an unconscious way. Because 95% of how we interact with the world is unconscious. We're only consciously aware of like 5%. And so we got to un uncover and understand where those stories and those stories are usually the traumatic experiences that have helped shape the lens in which we view reality from a young age. And we have to go do the work. That is the work that we're talking about is this deep healing work of how we interact with the world and how we were told to interact with the world through the experiences that have led up to this point. Yeah, absolutely. On top of journaling meditation, what would you say are like daily practices that you hold to continue to do this work versus ones that would maybe be something that you do on a monthly uh, an annual, semi-annual basis? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, I, I, I have a daily meditation practice, even if it's just for five minutes. Um, I think, you know, one thing to really deepen the practice, if you do have a, a meditation practice, is, you know, I love uh, the work of Adi Ashanti. He's a, a Zen Buddhist Westerner who is really, he has some really good books. And he talks about the journey towards enlightenment. Meditation is only one aspect of the three things that you need that lead to enlightenment. You need meditation, you need contemplation, and you need inquiry. And so meditation allows you to slow down and just bring an awareness to your thoughts by finding stillness. Contemplation is, is allowing yourself to think about what those thoughts are coming through. Like, what does this mean? Where does this come from? And then inqu inquiry is asking the question, the deeper questions of like, what does this mean? Where is it coming from? The origin of this. And so as you implement all three of those, you can start uncovering the stories of your own psyche. And when you move those out of the way and you get to the deeper parts of the onion, you realize that you're the observer of the experience. And that same observer in me is the same observer in you and the same observer of someone else. And that is the concept that we are all one. We are all more alike than we are different. We are all an aspect of the creator that is divinely inspired within us. And until we can get to those deeper layers of who we are, we really can't understand those except conceptually. And so you have to embody these practices daily and how quickly the ego and the stories of who we are will infiltrate back into our lives so suddenly, right? And that's why it's a, it takes daily work and daily practice and setting up a morning routine, building momentum from the morning into the day, because it's not like enlightenment's not something that you reach and then all of a sudden you're good. It's a constant unfolding and being aware of the present moment as it's unfolding in front of you. And if I don't meditate for four or five days a week, I'll start getting kind of stressed out, anxious, overwhelmed. And it's really fascinating. Like, well, why am I like feeling this? Cause it's such a subtle thing. That's not like, you know, physically I can feel pain. I'm like, Oh, I didn't do yoga today, but this mindset and the lens in which you view reality, these stories start creeping in. And that's when I know, okay, I haven't really been practicing my meditation. So I literally like, even though I feel like I have so much to do and this is what you talked about, like you can't find time for this stuff. You have to create the time 
for this stuff. And then when you do, you, it, you realize it has such a profound impact on your life because you can create the space you need to really slow down. It's not going to find you. You have to find it. Yeah. hundred percent. The, I mean, I was on vacation the last four days and I recognized as I was getting home, I was like, wow, I haven't done, you know, I, I like using insight timer and, and kind of the, the music within it to really slow down and relax and meditate. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, I haven't done that in four days. Is that why I'm feeling anxious? Like, cause I, I, I love Mondays. I love Tuesdays whenever like I'm getting back to work cause I enjoy what I do. Mm-hmm. But it, it's like, even though I was in a state where I was relaxed, there was something missing. And it's like that, that calling back to get back to that. What, when you're coming back to the heart collective and, and the guys that you're working with, what do you say is like the, the biggest thing that people are resistant to? And it like, they get this part, they get, you know, maybe the yoga right away, but then they're like, wait, like I got to do like a deep emotional work. Like how, how does, how do you coach and, and teach people through that? Yeah. Um, it's, it's challenging, especially with the kind of, the, the, the clientele that I'm working with and attracting and, you know, it's, it's really trying to figure out, you know, how to grow the community. I've got a solid foundation of, of some members that are really engaged, but you know, it's, it's really fascinating. Like there's guys that, and I'm still trying to navigate this as an entrepreneur and figuring out the right kind of way to, to, to get guys engaged into the community and bought in because, you know, as a former athlete, you, you have an ego, right. Of who you are and how you show up in the world. So, unless you like or have the awareness that there's deeper work to be had, it's hard to kind of infiltrate that something kind of needs to happen for them to, to seek it out. And then there's the guys that kind of have done, have done the work and they found success and kind of transitioned out successfully, maybe not necessarily in a deeper way, but they found something to like find success in, in this world and they feel like they don't need it. Right. And so it's, it's hard to kind of pitch this community because it's not a self-help thing, but I think if you don't understand this kind of deeper work in the community and the benefit that that provides, you can look at it with this like, Oh, I don't need that. Like I'm not broken. I, you know, and every, it's a story in our culture too. Like, you know, especially men, it's like, I don't, I don't need a therapist. I don't need someone to talk to. And you know, the powerful thing about a therapist is they are present there. And a lot of the work is them inquiring and being curious about your story and getting you just to process, right. Just talk. And the thing I've found and the thing I'm excited about building this community is that a lot of people don't understand the unique experiences that a former athlete goes through, even a therapist, even a professional. And there's something really powerful about being in a community of relatable experiences, guys that understand what you're going through. And so you can feel heard, you can feel seen and you can just express. And it's not about seeking help or or fixing something that's broken. It's about, the power of presence. That's where the healing is. So creating a container where you can just feel seen and heard for you, who you are. Cause we all put these masks on, right? These personas of who we want the world to view us as who we want to be projected as. And very rarely until we can really slow down and understand ourselves on a deeper level, the shadow aspects of who we are and bring those to the light, then we're, we're going to be kind of showing up with this mask and playing in the masquerade. And it's okay. Like we, we just want to be seen and heard for who we are. And there's so much healing power in that. And that's really what it's all about. Yeah. I mean, that seems like, especially for people who've been really successful to get them to understand the value in showing weakness, Mm -hmm. right. Or vulnerability. Uh, I I remember, not I remember it was like nine months ago, I started seeing a therapist and it's been great. It was right when COVID happened, you know, everything had slowed down. I was like, everything I was bringing to the world kind of in the same way as an athlete where it's like, I was bringing so much to the world and now it's like, what, what value do I have? Mm. And even on days where there's nothing really deep to dive into, I felt like poking holes in the potato where it's like you put a baked potato in the oven, you poke holes in it. So it doesn't explode. Mm. And I feel like you see that a lot, whether it's with people that that just like they get so bent up in energy and they don't release anything Mm. that unless you have some way to release it, even if it's just a little bit, you're depressurizing the chamber. And that's how I, I sometimes will, will pitch it to people where they're like, why are we doing this? And it's like, I'm just poking holes in the potato, man. We don't <laughs> have to explode. I love um, that. Dude. I'm going to definitely use that. Yeah. Cause it, I, it is like when we don't express our emotions, especially in real time and we don't know how to, in a healthy way, we repress them and we hold on to them and they actually can end up showing up in physical illness later in life because that energy is stored in the somatic response of the body. Right. And, being able to process that and uncover that and release that energy is really 
profoundly healing and it helps us feel lighter and less triggered in different situations. Yeah. The, I don't know if it's a quote, but Brandon Duncan, who's in fit for service told this mm-hmm. to me, he was like, emotion is energy in motion. And I was like, when I grasped that concept, I was like, Oh wow. Like that means I'm putting this little tiny train deep inside, you know, myself. And eventually that train's got to come out and then you bunch stack a bunch of trains in there. That's a lot of motion that's got to yep. go somewhere. Uh, yep. So just a cool way to visualize that. Curious, you obviously worked with a ton of professional coaches, some of the best leaders. What are some of the things you learned in the NFL uh, or college or wherever? People who were really good leaders, people who were really good coaches. What are some of the things you learned from them that you now use and apply either in an entrepreneurial sense or with the, the people that you're working with? Yeah. And, you know, funny enough, I think the, the most profound lesson I've had um, came was one of the very first lessons I had on the football field. It was like you know, freshman year of high school when I first started playing. And I remember the coach, we were hitting a sled, I think. That was a long time ago. Um, we were hitting a sled and, you know, I, I kept hitting it wrong, you know, and, and he was like, no, hit it like this. And I kept hitting it wrong. I had no idea what I was doing. I just started. And I remember he like pulled everybody, you know, grouped everybody up and he's like, he gave us a little lesson. He said, you have to be coachable. It doesn't matter if you make a mistake but you can't make the same mistake twice because if you keep making the same mistake over and over again, it either means you, you can't do it or you don't care. And that was a profound lesson because, and I've, I've definitely used that in my life, especially as an entrepreneur, because it's not about trying to be perfect and never failing because you're going to fail because in the failure, that's where the most lessons are gathered. But if you keep going through life, making the same mistake over and over or you're in the same cycle or you're, you're attracting the same type of relationship or you're in a job that you just you like can't get out of you got to ask yourself like what am i doing here like what what is it in me that is calling this like what do i need to change in order to transcend and grow past this cycle that keeps showing up for me and so that was just a really profound lesson i'm so glad i learned it at such a young age because it allowed me to go play football lights out as fast as i could and it allowed me to fail because if I'd fail, if I got beat in a certain way, or I tried a technique and it didn't work, I would learn from it. And, you know, transferring that onto life has been a really, really profound and impactful lesson. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's talking about childhood traumas, right? To the, on the flip side, it's like, that's a, maybe we could even call it like a positive impact, positive trauma to like, that's something that stuck with you your entire life. Whereas mm-hmm. as you get older and older, you get layers and it becomes a little bit harder for things to sit and sit sit and sink that's the word i'm looking for i almost said stink Mm. um but i I think that's a really cool lesson some of my biggest lessons i remember i was bad i I didn't play basketball at a high level i played baseball in college but it was my high school basketball coach where i was like wow like this is what it means to absolutely hate practice but push yourself (laughs) to the to the degree to where you're like i thought i was done after two hours we went four and then did suicides like wow now what else am i capable of and so it's, it's, it's interesting. I wanted to be a high school teacher because of that. But then I was like, I can be, I can be a teacher in other ways. <laughs> what you, you talk about community a lot and you, you're creating a community fit for services, a community, uh, the locker rooms, a community. What are some of the things that you see that are really similar that allow like a really cool culture to be created? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one thing I realized in playing football. I was a part of so many different teams, so many different cultures, so many different locker rooms. I mean, every year in the NFL, there's so much turnover that every year the team is completely different, the energy of the team, the the culture of the team, and realizing how important the energy is. You know, I haven't really understood energy like I do now back when I was playing, but I I mean, I had an awareness of it, right? Like if one, if we brought in a free agent that, you know, it was kind of like a, like a bad apple that had this negative attitude, how infectious and contagious that was throughout the entire locker room. And so, you know, really trying to cultivate, and it really comes down to, to, to really good leadership, right? And guys, you know, and I had this journey, speaking about leadership, it's been one of my big life lessons, right? Because I played football for 16 years, and I never fully stepped up in a leader that I, sh- I could have been. Um, and what I mean by that is there was these moments that I felt inspired to maybe give a speech or call a guy out or kind of rah-rah guys up and in front of the team. And I was always a really good leader by example. I was always kind of like the fourth or fifth leader on a team. Everybody respected me, looked up to me. I was one of the best players. And I, 
I did what needed to be done. And when I played the game, I was like ferocious, but I never allowed myself to step up in that way that, you know, challenged others to step up to like a real leader. And in those moments, I'm thinking back on them, you know, nobody else knew those were coming up within me, just me. But instead of acting out on them and, and trusting them, I played small. And so I continued to play small in those moments. I never allowed myself to kind of reach that full potential of what I could be. And it's fascinating, this journey I've been on, because when I first walked away from the game, part of the reason I was you know, hitting the road is there was a piece of me that always knew I never really reached my fullest potential. And I was kind of like running away from it. And the universe is like, hey, you haven't, you haven't learned this lesson yet. You haven't learned to be a leader. And that's who you are. And that's what you're here to do. And it called me back into the, the, the athletic realm which is something I, I was trying to get away from. And I've worked through my own resistances the last year of my own fears, my own limiting beliefs, my own doubts to step up in this way as a leader, especially with all this kind of vulnerability and this deeper work, because it's like, oh man, how are guys going to respond to this? And I've had to go through my own journey, but really understanding and shifting and reframing what a leader is in my mind. Because I always thought a leader had to be perfect. A leader with somebody, if I was going to tell somebody what to do or they're doing something wrong or challenge them to step up in a way, then I had to be perfect because I didn't want to be seen or heard and, you know, people start throwing rocks at me if I'm not showing up in the way I'm challenging others to do. And so it was this idea, you know, it's kind of like in our society and culture for this, like what it means to be like standing alone, like the story of, of Rambo, right? Sylvester Stallone taking on 30 enemies and he, he ends up going through this battle and he kills them all and he comes out victorious alone. It's like, that's not what real leadership is. That's not what real masculinity is. That's not what it means to be a man. A real man and a real leader knows that he doesn't, he can't do it alone. He's only as good as the, the person next to him, right? And so I shifted and reframed my story of what a leader was. And it's now, I see it as just a role played on a team, a role played in a community. And that role is to remind everybody what the vision is what the bigger vision is, where are we headed? What are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? Where are we trying to get to together? And from that frame, it's not about telling people where they're wrong. It's about empowering them to step up and achieve higher levels of success and greatness and awareness so that we can reach this goal that we're all aligned on trying to get to. And it doesn't make me better. There's no hierarchy there. It's just my role is to remind everybody what the vision is. And in entrepreneurship, I've you know, grown so much in that aspect, building a team out now. It's like, my job is not to tell people as the boss what to do and get this done. And, you know, make sure you get this done, mark this task off. It's, it's like, Hey guys, like, where are we trying, where are we trying to get to? And how are we going to get there? And this is your role. And that empowers the team to create the vision with me rather than just being kind of cogs in the machine. They're, they're focused on the vision, which empowers them that they're, they're here to do something bigger than themselves. And I think that's what we all really you know, feel inspired by is making sure that we have something to get out of bed in the morning and, and something to have an impact on the world in a bigger way. Yeah. That's, that's, does it almost feel like you were meant to be a bigger leader in the NFL and then the universe is like, all right, we're going to reincarnate you to come and like fulfill that purpose again. I'm kind of thinking of like Gandalf in, in Lord of the Rings. I don't know if you've seen Lord of the Rings, but yeah. does, it, does it almost feel like that way where like now you're getting a second chance to do something that you wish you would have done? In the NFL, yeah, I, mean, I don't know different? if I look at it as a second chance because it's just such a different realm. Yeah, um, but I think it's it's kind of the lesson of my life. You know, I think we're all here to, we all come here as spirits, and this is just a, a maybe a concept that I like to entertain. I don't know for a fact, but we're I like to think that we're here, and we we choose these paths and these lessons, and we're confronted with a lot of these challenges and fears so that we can understand who we are on a deeper level and the powerful beings that we are. And my journey has been to step up as a leader. And so I believe the universe is going to keep giving me opportunities to, to conquer that fear, to step up, to show up for who I am. And I'm continuing to be challenged with this. This is not something I've transcended and I figured out I'm going to be like, yeah, it's, it's a constant journey of stepping up. But every time I work through a fear or a doubt or a limiting belief, it brings me closer to who I am on a deeper level, what I'm capable of, what I'm here to do. And it's just a more pure energy that I'm bringing into the world. And, you know, having the opportunity to come back, it's, it's not that, that I like chose to come back here. It's like, 
if I didn't, if I didn't answer this call and I decided, no, no, like that's too scary. I don't want to go do that. I want to go do this thing, you know, only a matter of time until the universe is like, Hey, this is it. This is what you're here for. Are you going to answer the call this time? It's like, ah, oh, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm going to go. And then I'm going to struggle and have a little bit of suffering and wonder why my, my life isn't turning out the way I want it. And why I want to be called for a big purpose and big and be of service because I feel this calling in my soul, but that's not the thing. It's like, Oh, maybe it's the thing that scares us the most. The thing that's most frightening. That is the thing that we're being called to because through that journey of conquering that fear, it's going to show us who we are and what we're capable of. And we have to go through that resistance to, to move through the other side and really expand as a spiritual being. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me a lot of, of the hero's journey. And, you know, at some point you, you're going to get put back on that path and there's going to be different people along the way to be like, Hey, you know, here's how, you know, you can avoid this, you know, pitfall or go in and save the day. It, uh, you, what you brought up earlier also kind of reminded me of something that was really resonating with me this, this weekend and today was just how much all this work is, is really sweeping the floor. Like you don't sweep the floor once. And then like the floor is clean, the floor is dirty the next day. You got to continually <laughs> sweep the floor. And so what you I was, the best analogies, man, what I was sharing today is that it's not a to B it's an infinity loop. Mm. And the work really is just to continue to stay on the path and the journey. And when I talk to people about, all right, we're going to, we're going to master this. I like to remind them that there's, it's not a, you get to level 100 and you're done it's the path of practice that is the path of mastery. If that makes sense. Um, and so it was just, it was really cool that you brought that up and I just wanted to double down on that question kind of out of the field, but we've talked a lot about like men's emotional health. Curious if you ever got a chance to watch the tiger woods documentary. I haven't. No. Okay. Um, I mean, that's just an example of a guy who got to the highest heights professionally, but there was a lot of emotional suppression. I heard um, he just got another car accident. Dude, you're like on top of the news. I, I haven't seen that. Well, no, I literally just got a text from my friends that follow golf. And they're like, they sent me a picture of this path of this car. And it's like, oh, Tiger question mark. And I was like, what's going on? I'm like, oh, Tiger Woods got another crash. Like, I guess, you know, last night or moments ago or whatever. And it's, yeah, man, it's just a, it's a reminder of, you know, there's, there's, there's more to life than, you know, the sports. It's like, you know, who, who, who are we and how are we able to process these these deeper emotional traumas and, you know, this mental health crisis that's, that's kind of sweeping the nation. It's, it's a, it's a spiritual journey. Yeah. And until we can find the tools and the community and the presence of others who are there to support us, it's, you know, and we can't, we have to show up for ourselves too, right? We have to, you have to have, take that first step into the vulnerability to be able to say, Hey, I, I need support. We all do. Yeah. 100%. Hundred percent. The next question I'd have for you is, you don't. You're not a guy that's going to be like, hey, if I can do this with you know my entrepreneurial career, then that will be it. Then I think I'm done. I can retire. But what would you say like is the next kind of horizon that you're working towards, like a Lombardi, to where you're like, if I like this next milestone would be something really cool for you to go and either help other guys do, go and achieve. Like, what's kind of on the, the horizon for you? Yeah, so I just launched the the Heart Collective. So the journey right now is really focused on on growing this into a really impactful, powerful, purpose driven community, filled with a lot of like minded men, leveraging the community, the energy of it, the network to really make a bigger impact in the world, um, and do you know focus on working on you know big projects. We're gonna do uh, working on our first retreat experience right now. So I wanna um, continue to grow the community you know, host these amazing retreats and really help uh, guide these guys into the deeper work. Um, I'm also working on writing a book right now, which holy man, um, is a daunting task and it's challenging me in a lot of ways. I've been working on it for over a year now and um, it's evolved so much just because I've been evolving so much. It's almost like my writing coach tells me all the time. He's like, you need to get the book written because you're going to constantly like, if you take too long, you're going to constantly be growing and then you're going to want to add to the book from this new lens that you're feeling reality. And it's like, you know, sometimes you just got to, got to get it written. And you know, I've just dove back in a couple of weeks ago and I'm starting to get this new flow of what I'm tr actually trying to write. And so I'm excited about bringing that, you know, into manifestation and, and really getting it done. I th think it's still, you know, a few months away, but it's, it's really challenging me. So I'm going to focus on that. I think that's going to be really cool to share my story on a deeper level. 
Um, and then I, I love investing. I love startup investing. Um, I have a portfolio of about seven companies right now and really, you know, hoping some of those pop and being able to create, um, you know, energetic abundance um, and being able to use that energy to really have an impact in the world, you know, cause a lot of people have the story that, that, that money is evil, but it's money is just energy, right. And right. working through and accumulating this energy so that I can use it for, you know, good and having an impact in the world. And, um, you know, that's kind of the, the big vision where I'm at now, obviously it's always, always evolving and, and we'll see what, what happens. Yeah. And, and lots of time too. I always like to say like, I just turned 30, which isn't that old at all, but I'm like, I got 70 more years. And so it's like, mm-hmm. man, you got so much more time to do that. Uh, and it's super exciting. What, what, any, any ideas on what that retreat's going to look like, like location, you're going to fly in some like ET, the hip hop preacher, or someone to get everyone <laughs> jazzed up. Um, so the first retreat, we're going to start small. It's going to be a little bit more intimate experience, probably 10 to 12 guys. We just uh, locked down, uh, a house Airbnb uh, in Colorado in the mountains. So it's going to be a weekend retreat. We're going to do some, some breath work, some workshops. We're going to do a hike. We're going to, there's a really beautiful river that goes through the mountains. It's uh, we're going to do some cold plunges and really just connect on a deeper level. Um, and then I'm really excited about our next retreat, which will be in September, which I've already locked down. Um, it's going to be a river rafting experience, four days, three nights through the gates of Lador in uh we, west northwestern colorado into utah and um so we're going to kind of retreat on the river so we're going to be out in nature doing this really beautiful experience but also doing workshops on the river in nature being able to connect with ourselves and our surroundings and each other um yeah and then just continue to evolve from there yeah that sounds dope was there any spots that you wish you would have gotten to uh in the van with uh with the dog for the blog that you just didn't get to uh, in the u.s yeah, yeah, definitely. I didn't spend much time in the Pacific Northwest, which I hear is beautiful. That's up where you live. Yeah. yeah. Um, Northwest. So I, I really, you know, I want to spend some time up there. But me and my wife, we have a baby on the way, which is, you know, due in the next, within a month. So congrats. I'm prepping for that. Yeah, thanks, brother. And so actually looking to sell the van. So if anybody's interested, reach out to me. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty nice van. Probably a, a, it's a big ticket item. Um, but I'm going to sell that. And we're going to actually get an F-350, put a... Uh, slide in camper van on it so that we can all travel together and so at some point we'll make it up there i'll hit you up cool yeah sounds good um uh, there's so many spots in washington even that i haven't been to and uh one i, I lived in portland for a little while as well and one thing that's cool about that is the entire coastline of port of oregon is uh public so oh, you, wow. could, you could do some good camping up there, there. The park. yeah exactly so cool man well um I've enjoyed having you on and I think it's a really powerful story and look forward to connecting more. Where can people yeah, find you on social media, uh, podcast? Uh, how can people connect? Yeah, thanks. Um, I've got two podcasts. One of them is called Quantum Coffee, uh, where we discuss the unanswerable questions of the universe, um, God, spirituality. It's really just fun conversations, exploring the things that we don't really know, the ineffableness of the experience that we're having. Um, so check that out. Also life beyond the game, which is where I bring on former pro athletes to talk about their transitions out of sports and how they're handling that and unique challenges. Um, you can check out and find the content I'm, I'm putting out into the world at joe hollycom is my personal website. And then if you're interested in checking out the heart collective, it's the heart collective.com spelled H A R T the heart collective.com. And I'm also on Instagram at joe Cool. Uh, definitely make sure and plug those in the show notes. Other than that, man, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I wish everyone could see this really cool bear. Is that a painting? Is that charcoal? Yeah, it's a painting. It's yeah. it's pretty it's amazing. A, yeah, super, super cool. For it. Cool, man. Well, thank you so much for the time. Uh, we'll catch up soon. Thanks, brother. Have a good one. Before I let you go, just want to say thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you got any value out of the podcast, be sure and share it with someone. Leave a five-star rating and review and subscribe to the podcast. Helps me continue to get on awesome people like Joe, former athletes, people that are doing awesome things in the entrepreneurial space, leading, creating communities. And speaking of communities, if you're interested in a fitness community to help challenge you, push you, uh, not only see results physically, but also learn and educate yourself on why things work, how they work together, uh, I would invite you to look up the eight-week challenge. You can find that at downdogathletics.com. We'll be having registration opening up probably in the next couple weeks if you're listening to this. 
uh, in February or March. The next group is going to launch April 18th. And so you got plenty of time to lock in right there, but just go to downdogathletics.com. You'll be able to click on the eight week challenge link right there on the front. Or you can also go to my uh, social media handle, Paul underscore Klingon or Down Dog Athletics as the Instagram channels and be able to find it that way. Other than that, hope you guys have an awesome rest of your week. I'll catch you guys next time on the Mindful Muscle Podcast.